This morning, my message is titled The Threefold Period of Jesus. If you have your Bible with you, open it to Hebrews chapter 9. I'll read some verses there, starting verse 23 with you. Uh, this, uh, you know, the Bible uh, teaches the threefold aspects of salvation and uh, threefold appearing, and this kind of fits right in, in, in that area. Uh, you know, the Lord came, died for our sin to save us from hell, and now He's in heaven on the right hand of the throne of God, right? and uh, make an intercession for us to deliver us, excuse me, deliver us from the power of sin on a daily basis. And then one day he's going to come back and uh, get us, and uh, that will take us out of the very presence of sin. So, you know, if you read uh, Psalm 22, and it talks about there the death of the words uh, that we that the Lord cried out a thousand years later was predicted in that psalm when it says, it says, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? He was hanging on the cross dying for us. 23rd Psalm, and we read, it seemed like uh, a lot of times you read that at a funeral, but that's for you and me, and he's living every day for us. Uh, you know, and uh, David said, Surely that. I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. He was thinking one day it will be over here and I'll be, I'll be with him. And then the 24th Psalm is dealing with the coming of a king. And so uh, we know that he came and he went back and now he, we're waiting for him to come again. And that is our uh, blessed hope that we expect it. We don't we don't like our English word we use today. Well, I hope so. It's like I'm not sure. Well, the hope in the Bible that we have is that we, we know it's going to happen and we're expecting it. We just don't know when. And so in this, 20, in this 23rd verse in Hebrews chapter 9, he says, It was therefore necessary that the patterns of things in the heavens should be uh, purified with the, these but the heavenly things themselves the better sacrifices than these. For Christ is not entered into the holy places made with hands, which are the figures of the truth, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. Nor yet that he should offer himself often as a high priest, entered into the holy place every year with blood of others, for then must he often often have suffered since the foundation of the world. But now once, and I want you to underline that word once, in the end of the world hath he appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. And as it is appointed that the man once to die, but after this the judgment, so Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many, and unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. No, he has appeared. And you know, this, this is the time of the year whenever there's uh, you know, a lot of uh, gift giving time, you know, celebration of the birth of the Lord Jesus Christ. And he, uh, he came. He was uh, born into the same kind of flesh that you and I have. He, he, that's why the Bible says that he's touched by the feeling of all of our infirmities. He knows what your, your life, what you go through and your feelings. And so he was born, and he, but he was born to die for our sins. He came to that very specific purpose. And appeared on this earth in verse 26 says, For well, then must he often have suffered uh, since the foundation of the world, but now, once in the end of the world, hath he appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. I cannot really put enough emphasis on the fact that there's only one sin that, that man will be spending eternity for and hell for, and that's the sin of unbelief. Ninety-nine times at least in the 
New Testament talks about believing in the Lord Jesus Christ. And the one verse says, He that hath the Son hath life, he that hath not the Son hath not life. He has appeared, and he appeared to put away sin. And, and uh, one verse, one of the verses in 1 Corinthians 15, chapter verse 3, he said, For I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins, according to the Scriptures. And then he went on to say that he was buried and that he rose again according to the Scriptures. And so Christ died for our sins. Our Lord far is in our stead. In your place, in my place, he appeared for that purpose. You know, it's, a, it's just a matter of history. When we're talking about him, we're talking about something that he did for us almost 2,000 years ago. And so it's a matter of, of history with us. And, and it's the fact that he died and how that he died. He didn't just die. He died for our sins. He died for you and me personally. Uh, Romans chapter 5, verse 6 and, uh, through 11, and, you know, talks about the, in the, in, at the it's due time, it calls it, it's a specific time which God had chosen. It'd be at the very height of need of a man's sin being taken care of that Christ died. In verse 6 in Romans 5 it says, For when we were yet without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die yet for adventure. For a good man some would even dare to die but God. What a conjunction. But God. But God commended His love toward us in that while we were yet Sinners, Christ died for us. You know, as uh, Gary points out, the New Year is coming and New Year resolutions and stuff that people do every year. That, that's something we do and most generally fail over and over again because of the nature that we, we have, uh, which is a sinful nature. But one good thing about our Lord is that He didn't wait till you got everything right to die for you. He said that while we were yet with, uh, uh, you know, while we're yet sinners, Christ died for us. Uh, much more than being now justified. <clears throat> this is one of the problems I pointed out in the devotion this morning, is people have a problem realizing that when they accept Jesus Christ as their own personal Savior, they are made right. It's not a over and over again thing. It's one time thing that God justifies us. He takes us from being dead and trespassing sins and puts us into His righteousness and makes us right. And so He said in, so in verse 9, much more than being now justified by His blood, we shall be saved from wrath through Him. For if when we were enemies we were reconciled to God by the death of His Son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by His life. And not only so, but we also joy in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom we have now received the atonement, the payment of sin. Second uh, Corinthians 5, verse 14 says, For the love of God constraineth us, because we must <coughs> judge that if one died for all, then we're all dead. And that He died for all that they which uh, which live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him which died for them and rose again. Do you, do you see what he's saying? That we're, we're saved, and we're saved for him and by him, and we're not saved to live unto ourselves. But that's where we get ourselves in trouble. We get away from the Lord by thinking, oh, well, I'm going to live for me. This is for me. This is what I'm going to do. But we're to live for God. We're to live for the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, you know, Christ, uh, He became a curse for us. When you look at the time when He was here, and He was in the upper room, and He was with the disciples the night before uh, He died. And then he, he marched across that old uh, valley over there into the Garden of Gethsemane. 
And he prayed three different times. He asked the, the father to let this uh, cup pass from me. He hadn't even touched it yet. Then he said in another prayer, the next time he said, take this cup from me. It's like he has it in his hands, but he hasn't taken it yet. He has a drink of the dregs so of the sins of the that cup. In the last prayer, he said, remove. If it be possible, remove this cup from me. But all three times he ended his prayer with, nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. I want you to know he didn't mind dying for you as a person and me, but he had never in all eternity been separated from his father. And the sins that was in the in that cup was going to separate him from his father in heaven. And when he took that cup, he took the sins of all the world, whatever sin you could ever think of, he took it on himself. And he became the sinner. He became the worst sinner in all the world. Everything a man could ever do or think of doing, he took that. He never sinned himself. He knew no sin, but he took that cup that had all of our sins in it. And he marched out of that garden and they arrested him there and they took him, put him through a mock trial. And he willingly walked out to the, to the uh, Golgotha. I don't believe they had to force his hands. I think he, because he was with them. You and me down the old center, the center that he's dying for, he just laid his hands out. Probably said, put it right through here. They whatever they did to fight, put him on that old cross, he willingly lay down his life. He became a curse for you and me. He loves us so much. In Galatians 3 13 says, Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us, for it is written, Cursed is everyone that hangs on a tree. He paid the price. First Peter 2 24 says, Who his own self bear our sins and his own body on the tree, that we being dead to sin should live unto righteousness, by whose stripes we were healed. 1 Peter 3.18 says, For Christ also hath once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit. He has appeared. It's past tense. It's history. But for those that have not believed in him, he's reaching out his hands, saying, Come unto me, all ye that labor are heavy laden, I will give you rest. Well, I'm so thankful that he now has appeared for us. In verse 24, you know, it talks about him, him being there in the presence of God. He he's says, in uh, Romans 8, 34, it says, who is, who is he that can demon? It's, it is Christ that died. Yea, rather, that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us. I suppose you, like me as a young Christian, I was 30 years old and I was saved. But I, those songs that uh, they'd sing with the little children, they meant so much to this old guy here, the 30 year old. And one of them that I always liked was, whose sins are you talking about? And I, I could just see Satan up there work, trying to point out my sins to, to the, the Father. And, the, and he said, whose sins are you talking about? I, he don't have no sin. Yeah, you, you don't realize that the one sitting here on my right hand took all of his sins, past, present, and future, whatever he's done or did, will do in the future, even that today, I paid for those. He doesn't have anything that you can condemn him for. And that's why Paul wrote, who, who, who is he that condemned him? Christ is the one that died. How can you condemn the one that died and was, uh, had the power to lay down his life and raise it up again? 
in 1 John 2, 1, he said, My little children, these things write I unto you that you sin not. And if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. Jesus Christ, excuse me, Jesus Christ is perfect. And we've been made to be accepted in Him, not apart from Him. When our Father in Heaven looks down, He doesn't see you. I'd hate to know that He's looking at me. He sees me in His Son. And all the favor that He's given toward His Son, He's putting toward me or you because we're in the Son. And all the grace that He's given through His Son, He's given to you and me because we're in the Son. And we're protected by Him. I've, I've said this before, but... <laughs> best old place in Ohio. I had five brothers older than me and a sister and, and my sister was here yesterday. All my brothers are uh, just like they all did when I was younger. They always made me be last. And this time, the only time I was glad. They all went home and left me here. They passed on. But they used to fight for me. I tell you, if you would have just made like you were going to touch me, they would all be on you. I thought, I don't know, just looking at them, how they care, how much more the Lord loves me. How is Satan going to touch me when he's protecting me? Only when I get out from under the umbrella of protection, when I just deny the Lord, I don't care, I'm going to do my thing, I don't care what you do to me, I can guarantee you get spanking. But we're in Christ Jesus the Lord. John 13, 10 says, Jesus said to him, He that is washed needed not save, to, uh, uh, excuse me, to wash it, but his feet. But uh, he is clean every whit, and ye are clean, but not all. You know, every day we need to live in a daily confession of our sins. John wrote five books in the Bible. That is, God used him to write down John, 1st, 2nd, 3rd John, Revelation. In in third John, and I'm mean, at first chapter there in verse one, he said or seven. I'll get it straight. Verse eight, he said, If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. And he used the word we. Now he is used to, of God to write down. If we say we don't sin, we're lying. And we call God a liar, verse ten. But in verse nine it says, If we confess our sin, he's faithful and just to forgive our sin and, and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. He makes it as though we didn't even do anything that caused a break in not of sonship, but a break in of fellowship. We break fellowship with one another. But I've got, uh, that's my son sitting there with this, those two good looking boys and that pretty girl. That girl just one of my new friends. But those boys are my grandsons. But they have my blood in their veins and they may deny me all they want to. But they're mine. They'll always be mine. Just like you are to your dad, your mom, your theirs. They can give you away and get more. They can't give away that blood, though. And that's the way we are. That's why Jesus said that which is born of the flesh is flesh. Can't be changed. And he said, that which is born of the Spirit is Spirit, and it can't be changed. We're born from above. We're children of God. We may not always please Him, but we should live in a daily, constant, daily, even in my own opinion, an hourly life of confession of anything we've done that should have hurt His cause or hurt anyone else. You know, and he says, like cleansing a slate. He just wipes it clean when we confess. Makes everything right again. I know when I ran away from home and I came back about six weeks later, I really thought my dad would probably say, you're not welcome here. But my dad said, I'm glad you come home. Just like the prodigal, Jesus said, I'm glad you came back. That's where he's up there now on your behalf. That's how much he loves you and me.
constantly and instantly make an intercession in our behalf. He, he appears in the presence of God for us. Hebrews 4, verse 14 says, To be seen then that we have a great high priest that has passed into the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our, our confession, for we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. You know, I was, uh, when I was about 18, I went with a girl that, from Odessa, and she had an uncle that was a priest, and I went with her to their family gathering, and, and I listened to him, and, not, and I'm, I'm just telling you what he said and laughing about it, that people come to the confession booth Confess, and I'm over here reading my book, or if I want to get up and go to the restaurant, they don't even know I'm left. Not touched by the feelings of their infirmities. Just another sinful human being that needs salvation by grace, just like they do. But we have a high priest in heaven that listens carefully to every word you say and will do something for you about it even placed within us a Holy Spirit that knows how to take our prayer and make it the way we really want it in any way. Because He cares for us. But I like this 16th verse. He said, let us therefore, since we have someone like that who cares so much and touch so by us, let us come boldly to the throne of grace. I'm pretty sure Ricky could say I ran to my dad and asked him, he said, would you just leave me alone, man, until this show's over or this football game's over? <coughs> you know, my kids were little. I don't know if you've done your don't do that. I was bad. So I said, wait, just, I didn't say get away. I said, wait a minute, wait a minute. And then they didn't care whether I answered them or not after that. They wanted to know something right then, you know. So, you know, but the Lord says, come boldly. I won't run you away and I won't say, wait, I'm busy. I'll listen to you, and I'll hear everything you're saying. You know, the one good thing about it, I don't care what, what happens to us, nothing. I don't know if you know what John 6, 37 says or not, but if Jesus said they come coming to me, I will in no wise cast out. No, the, no wise is two little Greek words that means not even one thing can cause me to cast you out. There, uh, and then he uses the word, it's translated nothing in some places, and there's nothing that can separate us from the love of God. Listen to these verses in Romans 8, 35. Who shall separate us from the love of God? Excuse me, the love of Christ. Shall tribulation or distress or persecution famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword, as it is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long, we are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I am persuaded, Paul said, that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature. That word creature is, has been an easily translated creation. There wouldn't be any, if there could be anything else that could be created. Couldn't separate us from the love of Christ. He said, shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our, our Lord. Not even one single thing. Not even you. And that's when the Lord said uh, you know, for security, I I have you in my hand. And no man can place me out of my hand. Well, we, we think when we don't count this man, so I can pluck myself out of his hand. No, no one, not even one thing that can be done can cause you to ever be separated from the 
sonship or from being a child of the Lord once you accept him as your Savior. And therefore, you can't be separated from the favor that he wants to show you if you just let him show it. In Hebrews 7, 25, it, it's, you know, it says, we, we ever live with, he said, Wherefore, he is able also to save them to the uttermost that come unto God by him, seeing he ever liveth to make intercession for them. <coughs> and then last, he shall appear. And this is the one I look forward to. I, I pray every single day, God, I want to live for my life. If my wife don't die, please let me live. I want to be here for her. And then if you want to take me at that same moment, that's okay. I'm ready to go home. And I know I'm ready. But I just don't want to leave her, you know. I know one thing. I, I can be, by my health staying like it is, I can at least be there with her. And I can feed her and I can talk to her. But if I leave her, I don't know how often she can have her grandkids or her kids because they're all working. Me, I'm just a preacher. They only work Sunday, and that's it. <laughs> no, I get to be with her. I'm blessed to go see her every day. But I'm ready. And and that's the next appearing. I'm ready. When he appears, everything will be made right. You know, verse 28 talks about that. He shall appear. Titus talks about it. Chapter 2, verse 11 through 13. He said, For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. I was talking to my oldest sister. Uh, she, she and I, of course, we go back to the well, I was the oldest of my dad and moms, and then I have my half brother and sister. But they, they, uh, one of the boys for some reason just didn't like her. They were step brother and sister, and he did something that this, well, his own brother, they got in a fight, and my dad and mom was about a quarter mile from the house, and they put me out on the front porch of the house, old farmhouse, and you watch for dad and mom. And they fought like cats and dogs. And I saw my mom and dad turn the corner. I said, here come mother and dad. And boy, they straightened the house up. You would have thought they were the angels all the time. My dad and mom were gone. With all the tables, the chairs, whatever they had turned over, the fighting was straight. And my mom and dad come home. They had purified themselves. And the Bible says if we're really looking for the blessing of hope, we'll... we'll straighten up the tables and chairs. We'll, we'll, we'll be right with the Lord. We'll live in a state of confession. We'll live honoring Him. We'll be looking for Him and, and looking for that blessed hope. First John 2, 3 verse 2 says, Beloved, now are we the sons of God. You know, if you, uh, when I was a kid, I went to a different kind of church as a little boy you could never say that right there and believe that because that you could lose your salvation if you did one thing wrong. And I'll tell you, I lied to my parents to keep them getting a whipping. I know I'd have been in hell by that standard. I wasn't born in the family of God yet. But he said, now are we the sons of God and it does not yet appear what we shall be. But we know this. We know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him. For we shall, shall see him as he is. And every man that hath this hope in him purified himself. Like my brothers and sisters got, especially my brothers that got the fight, they purified themselves. They got everything straight. And my dad had some plow lines that could leave some wet on you if you did wrong. He said they could purify himself even as he is pure. In other words, we'll wash our feet. We'll get the sins away from us that we've committed. We're already pure, pure as far as God's concerned by the blood of Christ, but we have those sins that this we did, and they get rid of them. But we'll appear with Him. 
when he appears. First Thessalonians chapter 4 and verse 13 says, But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that ye sorrow not even as others which have no hope. For if we believe that that we're, I do this sometimes and I say, if we were Baptists and been baptized and prayed through and believed that Jesus died, it's not in there. It is plain, God made it as plain as He could make it for us. He said, if you, if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, them uh, also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with Him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. <coughs> For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. I don't know how you can make it any clearer than that. That if you believe that Jesus died and poured for your sins and was buried and rose again for your justification and clear you of all guilt before Almighty God, then you're in Christ. And if you're alive when the trumpet sound and the Lord comes, you're just going to join those that's going to be raised out of the tombs and then together we'll be Sending up to meet the Lord in the air. And that is our blessed hope. That's what we're looking forward to. And it could be any moment, at any time. And my sisters told me they were coming Friday. I did everything I could to try to be out there looking for them. It didn't work out, did it? But uh, I, I was looking for them. I, couldn't, I was anxious to see them get here, get to be with them a little bit. Well, we should be just even more so looking for the coming of the Lord. I'm just closing saying this to you. If you have not accepted Jesus Christ as your own personal Savior, if you have not believed from your heart that He died on that old rugged cross for you, as though you were the only sinner in the whole world, He died for you, and He is buried for you, and he rose again on the third day for you, then today I would tell you that I'd get on my knees and beg you if it helped to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ as your own personal Savior. Go away from here knowing, without a doubt, I'm one of his children. I'm saved. And if the Lord's trumpet sound, I'm going to be with him. As we all stand, our song leader comes again. I invite you to come. For whatever reason that you may have in your own heart, for God and by His God. Page one twenty five. No long invitation, but long enough for you to let the Holy Spirit lead you to do what He's wanting you to do. And we've seen the very first verse.